I'm very honored to be with you through this video uh, and to be part of this incredible symposium uh, promoted by the Marshall Law School and University uh, on restorative justice. Restorative justice is a need for the world. Uh, I'm talking to you from Rome and uh, in Rome we are working also to try to improve the prison system so that uh, any sentence can have, uh, can contain some hope and uh, we are working to give an answer to the call by Pope Francis in this uh, holy year of mercy. Uh, I think that it makes sense to to speak about restorative justice, also about what the community of Santa Giro has been trying to do over the years. And I'm part of this movement. I've been part from when I was a teenager. Because we are in a time of war, in a merciless time when uh, children are used as human shields, for instance, in Aleppo and uh, in Syria or in Mosul. And, uh, we need to give an answer also to terrorism, to fear, to the caliphate. Uh, what I want to tell you, the first thing I want to say is that uh, the only law, the only justice that can really fight the caliphate is a justice and a, and a law that is always based, based on life. Because the caliphate, Daesh, ISIS, they love death. They express a culture of death. They use death to attract people, to multiply fear even when they do not, when and where they do not exist. So I think that the core of this symposium is the very center of what is needed by the world. But I think that more than myself, and I have been involved in the movement against the death penalty for all my lifetime, I would say, almost uh, at least half of my lifetime. Uh, and I am pretty convinced that we can always uh, promote a justice capable to respect life in any circumstance, also the life of the guilty ones. But I think that much better than me, Pope Francis had said uh, recently uh, words that are like stones and express exactly what we are looking for. Saludo a los organizadores de este Congreso Mundial contra la Pena de Muerte, al grupo de países que lo apoyan, especialmente a Noruega, país que lo acoge, y a todos los participantes, representantes de los gobiernos, de las organizaciones internacionales y de la sociedad civil. Quiero, además, expresar mi agradecimiento personal y también el de los hombres de buena voluntad por, con su, por su compromiso con un mundo libre de la pena de muerte. Un signo de esperanza es el desarrollo en la opinión pública de una creciente oposición a la pena de muerte, incluso como una herramienta de legítima defensa social. De hecho, hoy día, la pena de muerte es inadmisible por cuanto grave haya sido el delito del condenado. Es una ofensa a la inviolabilidad de la vida y a la dignidad de la persona humana que contradice el designio de Dios sobre el hombre y la sociedad y su justicia misericordiosa, e impide cumplir con cualquier finalidad justa de las penas. No hace justicia a las víctimas, sino que fomenta la venganza. El mandamiento no matarás tiene valor absoluto y abarca tanto a los inocentes como a los culpables. El jubileo especial de la misericordia es una ocasión propicia para promover en el, en el mundo formas cada vez más maduras de respeto a la vida y a la dignidad de cada persona. 
no hay que olvidar que el derecho inviolable a la vida a don de Dios pertenece también al criminal. Deseo hoy alentar a todos a trabajar, no sólo por la abolición de la pena de muerte, sino también por la mejora de las condiciones de reclusión, para que respeten plenamente la dignidad humana de las personas privadas de libertad. Hacer justicia no significa que se deba buscar el castigo por sí mismo, sino que las penas tengan como finalidad fundamental la reeducación del delincuente. La cuestión debe ser encuadrada en la óptica de una justicia penal que sea abierta a la esperanza de reinserción del culpable en la sociedad. No hay pena válida sin esperanza. Una pena clausurada en sí misma, que no dé lugar a la esperanza, es una tortura, no es una pena. Espero que este Congreso pueda dar un nuevo impulso al compromiso con la abolición de la pena capital. Por eso mismo animo a todos los participantes a continuar con esta gran iniciativa y les aseguro mi oración. Life is one. We cannot divide life. Uh, there is life or the contrary of life or humiliation of life. And uh, this is why I was involved and found myself involved in the struggle to reduce the power of the death penalty worldwide because I was part of uh, the story of the community of Sant'Egidio. And uh, the community of Sant'Egidio started in Rome, Italy, is now in more than 70 countries in the world with voluntary people, dozens of thousands of people that uh, try to live uh, according to one very simple principle, prayer, community, service to the poor, peace, dialogue. Uh, I think that... The uh, moment in which the pain of death becomes inutile or even embarrassing. I met many friends in America. I met Judge Sheila Murphy through her. I'm, I'm here with you. And uh, I also was involved in uh, different states of America to try to encourage people to be together to defeat the death penalty and to create alternatives. Uh, but I found myself in this uh, worldwide pilgrimage in the position of uh, knowing many different sides of the story. Uh, many friends of mine knew only one side or two sides or five, five sides. Then I found myself uh, knowing 13 angles of looking at the death penalty and uh, of looking at a new way of uh, inventing a justice that cannot create again crime because uh, 66, 67% of the people that uh, spend uh, and pay all their sentence come back to a jail very soon. So our justice system is broken, not only in America, but it's broken also in Europe. So we need to create uh, different ways. And then I found myself uh, with the responsibility of writing a book, 13 Ways of Looking at the Death Belt, a book that is now uh, there, where you are, in America, written for America, for Americans by an Italian. Why? This is a book to understand what it is about And the fact that I was an Italian, an outsider, maybe it was uh, a strange position, but today I think that it was uh, a way of having the chance and the opportunity to have a, a larger view. And this view is uh, for each American, not just for those who oppose the death penalty. I found myself uh, involved in fighting against the death penalty because uh, There was a, a death row inmate from uh, Livingston, Texas, that had written a letter to 
Italian media trying to find pen pals. And a friend of mine started to be a pen pal. So this is the reason why I found myself with the community of Santa Gira involved in the battle against the death penalty and at the same time going to Livingston, Texas on death row. When I came out from death row in Texas, I felt that uh, there was an incredible injustice that I was alive because inside that row there is so much humanity. These 13 ways of looking at the death penalty uh, is a sort of debt of friendship and a gift to America to try to communicate something about the meaning of life, how much life is wasted uh, by giving the death penalty to people. And uh, it is 13 angles because uh, uh, sometimes we think only the problem, problems of the victims which is true, and the family members of the victims. But we never think that there are other victims that are the family members of the person that is executed, the children. What, they did, what did they do wrong? And uh, we do not know sometimes that there are many f family members of the victims that do not want another death. There are people who spent 10, 20 years, 30 years, as a person exonerated just a few days ago here in the United States, that are innocent and uh, saw their life taken for no reason by the state. In the book there are the stories and the conversation with some of these friends of mine, uh, like uh, Nick Yaris. Uh, he spent more than 20 years on Pennsylvania death row. And, uh, when I met him, uh, I said, well, I'm sorry for you, Nick, uh, so many years. And he answered, why? I'm alive. I was a jerk. I learned so many things. I did not let them take my life. I spent more than 8,000 days on death row. I read more than 6,000 books. People do not think that these people are human beings. And so I think that this is a book to understand that America is not isolated in the world. The world is changing. And the world is changing means that this affects America. This is a book to create bridges and to help Americans to understand how America can be more America without the, the, the death penalty, because it is not part of the identity. It can be part of some bad habits, but not of being Americans, and not of being democratic America. Whatever has been done, society must never go be lower to the level of a killer. And when the state kills, it doesn't give, uh, it's not just retribution. The state kills in the name of each of us, also of those who oppose the death penalty. We must help our society not to legitimate, in any case, uh, a culture of death. And when the state kills, it says that under special circumstances, you can kill. I think that what now is happening with Pope Francis, that is speaking so openly against the death penalty, is something that can help everyone, every state, and also America. This book contains also a personal pilgrimage uh, through America, and not many Americans have done the same pilgrimage, and not many Americans entered that row. Everything started from a letter, from one relationship of friendship with a person on that row, Dominic Green, an African-American man, young man, a boy when he was uh, kept and brought to the death row in Texas. And I think that uh, Dominic Green is the one who explains to us better than any of us what is restorative justice and why it is necessary. But it is because of people like you and the people of Italy that allow me to fight. I mean, you may not realize, but Italy has become like my home. Well, when I first got here, right, you know, I came here um, with nobody, right? It's like 
I had to cut ties with friends and family to learn how to relive again, right? And it was through and because of the people of Italy that I learned to really understand, appreciate, and value my life. You know, they gave me hope. They gave me strength. They gave me something that I wasn't able to find from those who were a part of my life before, right? And so they have become, Italy has like become my, my family. <laughs> well, from how I grew up, being in this position now, it is, I would say, growing up the way I did, being in that cycle of violence, it kind of prepared me for a situation like this, even though it wasn't supposed to happen like this. So I can adjust to this and not let this place wear on me or get the best of me because I've been mentally prepared for it a long time ago, though I didn't know it. You know, it's, it's funny how everything works, works itself out, but that's what happened. Whereas we're taught to be more patient, more understanding, think more about what, a, I mean, how to make things happen. Because in, in reality, if you send us to die, and I mean, it just puts so much of your life in perspective. It makes you look at things in a whole another way as to where you just won't be who they want you to become or who they want you to be. I mean, they call me a threat to society to send us me to die and all this. I ain't never did nothing in my life that was violent. And they felt when I came down here, I would lose hope. And at some point I did when I first got here, but I was able to be around a bunch of older men because you know, I came here when I was a kid. So I was around older men who was like father figures. They were able to teach me for spiritual growth. Violence is one thing you have to throw away because it's something you cannot suc succumb to in here because you have no win. If you do anything, the repercussions are so so drastic, you're losing. So it, it makes no sense to, to act out, right? Each case costs like 2.5 to $7 million to execute one of us. Then I was going to show, you know, at, you know, it's past 320 executions right now. I was going to show that if those numbers were accurate, then you just spent between $1 billion and $7 billion to kill 320 people. I mean, you could you could do take that money. I know if you take the cost that they're they're paying to kill me and invest it in my life, they could I could have had a beautiful future. But instead, they don't invest in our lives. They they invest in destroying. It.